Well, I guess we can go ahead and get started in, I guess, like, let's just go ahead and get started now. Um, all right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for coming. Um, my name is Ali. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Applied Data Ethics. Uh, I am really excited to introduce Angelica Strohmeyer uh, today because uh, I've known Angelica for a couple of years. And uh, one of the things that I found really exciting about the work that she's done uh, up till now has been um, a real care and attention to really like the power dynamics and the relationships and the broader sort of contexts into which uh, systems get deployed. Uh, really often in the space that I'm from, um, we do these evaluations that are really like constrained and sort of sandboxed. And that's not to say that everybody does that, but um, we don't have enough attention or we don't pay enough attention to, um, again, the power dynamics that, that go into the real world. And it's really hard to know whether the systems that we design are going to play out the way that we expect them to if like we don't even understand that vulnerable populations are going to experience these systems really differently. Um, so I was so excited when I first found out about her work and I was really, really excited when she said that she'd be willing to, uh, sorry, sorry, to come and talk about uh, all of this stuff. And um, so with that, I'll uh, unspotlight myself and uh, let Angelica begin. Um, just remove my spotlight. Angelica, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction as well, Ali. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Thanks for everybody being here. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen for you. Um, there we go. There we go. So yeah, thank you very much um, for that lovely welcome as well and the lovely invitation. Um, as, as Ali said, my name is Angelica Strohmeyer and I'm a lecturer at Northumbria University School of Design in the UK, which is, as I understand it, kind of somewhere between assistant and associate prof in the US. It's a bit of a different system, so I'm not really sure. Um, but I've also put information about um, you can see my, my email address and my Twitter handle. I'm, I'm on there quite a lot. Um, but I've also put information about Fempower Tech on the slide, which is a feminist technology collective I am a founding member of, um, which I'll not talk about today and I'll shut up about it, but just thought you may be interested in looking that up as well. So today I want to talk to you about justice-oriented ecologies, which is a framework for doing research with, in, and for, NGOs, activists, community groups, and others who are made marginal or stigmatized in society. And I built this framework while working with a number of sex work support services and sex worker rights activists, both in the UK and in Canada. But it also draws on my work with people experiencing homelessness, addiction peer support workers, and from my long-term involvement with one specific um, charity who support people in particularly complex life situations who may experience a variety of forms of traumas, incarceration, poverty, addiction, having children in care, or who are engaged in other work and activities that are stigmatized in some ways. But I will explain more of that as I progress in my talk. I hope that you'll take away an understanding of what justice-oriented ecologies are and why it is important for me to think of justice as an orientation rather than a fixed, finite thing that technology or design can do. I also hope that some of my yet unanswered questions will be of interest to you and that perhaps will make you think slightly differently about your own work or the interconnected disciplines and industries we all may work within. And lastly, I hope that my practical experiences, political insights, methodological implications will make you ask some more questions of your world and, and of our world and your worlds um, and the opportunities for the future. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts at the end of my talk as well, as I hope there'll be quite a bit of time for us to discuss what I've said as well. Um, I'm going to be exploring justice-oriented design through Nancy Fraser's framework for justice and explain why it is important for me to see justice as it, in design as part of a wider praxis of hope towards better, more just futures. And to do this, I feel it's important to focus on the praxis of design and collaboration, so the design processes, rather than seeing technologies and designs as solutions to long-standing socio-technical, socio-cultural, or socio-economic inequities and oppressions. 
At the end of my talk, I'm going to be asking the question of what it means to engage in this kind of hopeful, justice-oriented praxis of design in a time of crisis. And here I'm not only referring to the current global pandemic, but pre-existing crises that have been exacerbated or in other ways impacted by COVID-19, such as the crisis of, um, of insecurities, of inequity, or of the or climate crisis, among many other things. But before I go further into my talk, there are a few people that I need to thank, though I'm not going to be specifically providing a list of names here. I just want to do this because I want to thank these people for talking to me, but also because so much of what I do is co-constructed in conversation with others, by writing and thinking with others, and by learning from those who give up their time to work with me. This has included uncomfortable conversations, conversations that have left me emotionally raw and mentally drained, but it also includes conversations that have, have made me excited, carefully curious, and many have left me remembering that I must always continue learning, that I must continue to unlearn my own behaviors while also understanding the role that white, cis, non-disabled women like myself have played and continue to play as allies and allies in justice discourse. I truly believe in the co of academia. And for me, it's about the collectives of thinking, writing, learning, and unlearning that give me hope for academia and specifically in design and technology research when we are met by histories of abuse. In my research, this co relates to co-writing, co-thinking, co-working, co-caring, and co-designing among many other things. But for the purpose of this talk, it also is integral to the framework of justice-oriented ecologies and the ways in which I believe we could and should be working with NGOs, communities, and other third sector organizations. So throughout my talk, I'm going to be using the terminology of third sector organizations because to me, it is more inclusive than other language like NGO or community. It is, I believe, a UK-based term but it's also a response to the kinds of organizations that support people in different ways. So you have the private and public sector organizations, and then everything that is outside of these two spaces is the third sector. This includes community groups and organizations, charities, NGOs, among many other formal and formalized groups. These types of organizations exist because people's support needs are not met by both the private and public sectors. This may be due to funding cuts in the public sector or the non-profitable nature of the support for the private sector. But often it is also associated with experiences of marginalization or stigmatization. Sometimes the people who are supported by third sector organizations are those who fall between the cracks of public and private service delivery accidentally, while other times their experiences simply do not fit into the tightly restricted and refined boxes that these two rigid sectors offer. This means the people who use third sector services experience many forms of injustice, including various degrees of precarity. At the same time, however, the organizations themselves that support these people also experience precarities. Their funding is often reliant on public monies and tend to be funded on a project by project basis rather than sustainably. This means that often people who use third sector services do so because they experience injustices on a personal, community, or systemic scale. And to help me understand this injustice, I've drawn from Nancy Fraser's theories of justice. So for Fraser, the most general meaning of justice is parity of participation. And perhaps you can already see just from the statement why I'm drawn to her theories as someone who is interested in participatory and emancipatory research methods. She sees this as a radical democratic interpretation of the principle of equal moral worth, where justice requires social arrangements that permit all to participate as peers in social life. Clearly, this is not the case in many instances but especially for those who are made marginal, who are stigmatized or criminalized with the last of, of this being inscribed into law in some instances, for example, voter rights in some US states, this is especially the case. So in, in the post-war days, what is known as the Keynesian Westphalian frame of justice was the main way of understanding justice. And the key, key concern was distribution. 
However, this frame is increasingly under contestation and actually in different ways is also seen as a major vehicle of injustice. So Fraser draws on this development um, of, in this historical development in her theory of multidimensional justice. In this framing, justice is seen as a constantly evolving process that works towards more just worlds on multiple levels. She writes about the democratizing dimensions of transformative politics, addressing first order injustices of misrepresentation of people and situations, second order injustices of misframing of our understandings of justice, and the third order injustice of how, the failure of institutional, institutionalized parity of participation. And that sounds a bit complicated, but these three um, three orders of justice relate to three questions that can be simplified um, to the following. So what does justice look like? How can we move towards this idea of justice? And who decides what the answers to these two questions are? And in this way of thinking, there is no redistribution or recognition without representation which I believe aligns well with sex worker rights and other right group slogans of nothing about us without us. This way of framing justice, of course, also means that there are instances where these three different questions or injustices do not align. There are instances where institutional ideas of justice are incongruent with what those affected by these frameworks consider to be just. And Fraser calls this abnormal justice. This way of understanding justice also is also why it is important to think of it as an orientation rather than a thing that exists. Justice is malleable. It is not a structure. It's not a system of law or policy. Justice or injustice is experienced and lived. It changes based on your access to formal processes, but also changes on the color of your skin, your religion, your work, your coping mechanisms for experiences of trauma, among many other things, of course. Seeing justice as an orientation to our work as designers, technologists, or researchers working with technologies allows us to use it as a lens to explore what we are working on. It allows us to ask questions with the communities who live in worlds of abnormal justice or experience injustices. It allows us to question structures, to subvert them, alter them, or build alternatives. It allows us to bring conversations of technologies away from the technicalities and architectures and instead allows us to see them as parts of wider ecologies of services and care. It allows us to see and understand the role and responsibility of technology design and development from a different perspective while simultaneously not directly looking for solutions. So using this justice orientation for our design work and using Nancy Fraser's multifaceted framework for understanding, seeing and exploring notions of justice can help us think about our design processes, not just the practicalities of what we do, but also the questions of why we do it, the worlds we want to create by doing it. Daniela Rosna asks in, in the introduction of critical fabulations, what would it take to understand design as a different kind of project? One that is both activist and investigative, personal and culturally situated, responsive and responsible, and goes on to develop her approach of design as critical fabulation or a theoretical intervention that reimagines established techniques and methods in design an approach that alters our understanding of traditional design and an invitation to work with stories that haunt our contemporary techno cultures. In an attempt to respond to Rosna's question, I want to make use of Maria Massoud's work of seeing design as a prefigurative politic, of seeing design as an opportunity to create the worlds we want to see in the here and now with the communities we strive to serve. So taking inspiration from her theoretical understandings of design, as well as John Law's call in his book, After Method, Mess and Social Science Research, to make the hinterland of research more visible, has led me to think about what it means to engage in a praxis of hope with third sector organizations as part of the process involved in meaningful action and design processes. How does it relate to traditional design research? And 
what does this look like in the mundanity of research practice as it relates to data collection, data analysis, and the publishing of results? The relatively simple argument I want to make about methodology is that the processes we use to develop research projects, collaborations, or encounters matter. I appreciate that looking at these processes in more detail allows us to build multi-layered accounts of research that unearth novel facets of our investigations. It allows us to investigate technologies and their uses, but it also allows us to imagine and enact possibilities for remaking the cultures that surround these technologies. So when working like this, common vulnerabilities, in this case of charities and academics, can be seen as a resource for a praxis of hope. Both third sector organizations and designers with a justice orientation to their work tend to work towards better worlds. So surely that praxis should then be mirrored in the development of technologies in the space. This relates to the research and project ethos, as well as the actions we take throughout and the subsequent outcome of projects. Haran writes about this praxis of hope by saying, I want to think about hope as an ethical commitment to recognizing oneself and others as both desiring subjects and vulnerable objects in the pursuit of social transformation and social justice, and as an ongoing practice of using our fears or anxieties to deepen and extend our capacity for intersubjectivity and intercorporeality. This practice is not an individual pursuit but one that is made possible only through relationships with others who share our hopes for a more just, less oppressive future. So these relationships we have with others and the care that is expressed in and through them exists also between researchers and collaborators. So looking more closely at these relationships, I understand that different forms of expertise can come together to create knotworks that help us build deeper understanding and engagements with our practices but can also be humbling when we make mistakes. So as Haran says, we need our allies to challenge us to act out of our hopes and not simply to reaffirm us in our anxieties. This then expands our understanding of caring relationships with collaborators, partners, participants. Looking at these issues together and putting this understanding into the context of designing technologies with and in third sector organizations, I learned that relationships, technologies, services are all part of a wider ecology of care and support. In turn, this means that any technologies that are used in third sector organizations do not work independently. They are part of existing and future service delivery and they are part of ecologies of care and also of the information ecologies that exist already in these systems. So this leads me to Nardi and O'Day's framework of information ecologies, which they claim uses and sees technologies with heart. They see technologies as part of a wider ecology rather than solutions to socio-technically, socio-culturally, and socio-ethically socio complex issues and also see information ecologies as a call for informed, responsible engagement with information ecology technologies at the local level. Using this framework, the digital tools, values, and people who make up the ecology become actors in the system to develop change. They argue that seeing these technologies as tools or things made to be used by an individual, or even as text, or a form of communication where its meaning can be reinterpreted in different social situations, or even as systems where there's a complex systemic perspective of the pervasive influence of technologies in our lives, separately is inadequate as none of these metaphors provide an understanding of the transformational change that is possible with the support of digital technologies. Instead, bringing these different metaphors together and merging their particular benefits into the metaphor of an ecology is powerful because it includes the importance of local differences while also capturing the strong interrelationships of the social, economic, and political contexts in which technologies are used and invented. So an information ecology is defined as a system of people, practices, values, and technologies in a particular local environment. Uh, 
where the spotlight is not on technology, but on human activities that are served by technology. There is a strong interrelationship between the different moving parts that make up this ecology, making any change that occurs within it systemic. This means that when a change is made in one aspect of the ecology, this will impact on the different ways in which the ecology functions as a whole. Furthermore, there is a diversity of people and tools that make up these ever-changing systems. And in a healthy information ecology, these diverse sets of actors complement one another to support an ongoing co-evolution. This means there are dynamics at work within the information ecology that constantly evolves as new ideas, tools, activities, and forms of expertise arise in them. This relates to directly how, to how third sector organizations and academia may change when working together. For this kind of ecology to work, however, Nardi and O'Day argue that people within it must be prepared to participate in its development. And looking at the ways in which digital technologies are developed when third sector organizations and academia work together, I would also argue that it is not only the people who must be prepared to participate in this development, but the resources, funders, policies, and wider contextual information available also need to be part of this evolution. Ultimately, however, using information ecologies means that technologies have impacts on the organizations within which they are used, which based on my experience and research is likely to be beyond their original intention. They have world-making effects. And taking the above into account allows us to ask questions not only of how and why third sector organizations work, but also to change the ways we look at digital service delivery, research, and design processes in this space. Research that relates to a praxis of hope should ultimately not only result in novel interactions with technologies that are meaningful to those involved in the process, but rather should also demand new ways of accounting for difference in, it, in inequity at the societal scale, that the technologies become just or truly sustainable designs, as was written by Dombrowski, Harmon, and Fox in 2016. Going even further than this, the design justice framework compels us to begin by listening to community organizers, learning what they are working on, and asking what the most useful focus of design efforts would be, as Costanza Choc wrote in 2019. Bringing this thinking into conversation with my earlier point that technologies are part of a wider ecology of services and care leads me to a concept I developed during my PhD research of justice-oriented ecologies. In my fieldwork, I worked with multiple sex work support services to develop and ideate on technologies to improve safety, reduce stigma, and co-develop services. By bringing together this fieldwork and thinking about organizational structures and the ways in which academia functions with or alongside the third sector, together with theories like Fraser's work on multidimensional and abnormal justice and Bonnie Nardi and Vicky O'Day's information ecologies, is how I develop this framework of justice-oriented technologies. I created this because I was trying to figure out what it means to do justice-oriented design, particularly with sex workers, which is why I think by bringing in some of my earlier work, I can now expand to thinking about working with others who are criminalized as well. I developed this because I felt there was a lack of language in our discipline to think through some of the issues I was facing, both when we work within, within an ecology and when we want to work to learn about the ecology. So what we need to think about while working with organizations who support people who are made marginal or stigmatized or criminalized, and what we need to think about when we are learning about the space. I've split up my thinking about that. So that's how I split up my thinking about justice-oriented ecologies. First, working within the ecology, which relates to the pragmatic work of designing, developing, and appropriating technologies with, in, and for third sector organizations as an academic, or perhaps industry or independent researcher. And two, working to learn about the ecology, which means we learn more about the research context in which we work and start to unpick some of the complications that are part of this ecology, particularly those related to abnormal justice. 
When working within the ecology, we rely on localized translations, where we translate everyday language from one context to another. For example, meanings of risk are very different in design and technology development compared to what risk may mean in a support service for victim survivors of domestic violence. On top of this, there is a need for synchronized co-evolution of the different worlds that collide or enmesh within the justice-oriented ecology. This relates, for example, to the ways in which academia and the organization itself develop alongside and with one another. This relates to temporal aspects of research and funding structures, as well as different needs for impact and publication or output of work, among many other things. And finally, it also relates to the need for invested compromise. This draws on notions of critical friends or thick care, as talked about by Maria Puig de la Bella Casa. Everyone in the ecology will have to make compromises as part of the relationships, and very importantly, not just us technology researchers. But we make these compromises because we are invested not only in the survival of the ecology and the humans and more than human things that make it up, but we are in invested in it thriving, developing, and making manifest that prefigurative politic we like to talk about as researchers. So when it comes to working to learn about the ecology, these are almost like high level implications for design. From working with and in third sector organizations, I have learned that we are constantly designing in and for risky situations. Whether that is the direct risk to safety or well-being of the people with whom we work, whether that is a person who uses or provides a service, the existence of the organization itself, which is especially the case when working with smaller or less well-funded organizations, but also for wider concerns of risk related to criminalization, stigma, and marginalization of the communities the ecology aims to serve. We are also designing for hybridity, which brings the discussion back to the disparate worlds of academia and technology versus the third sector. However, it also creates, relates to a more direct technological concern. The digital divide is real and many people don't have access to or do not engage with digital services. There's a serious need for services that have hybrid functions where paper-based in-person contact is available wherever possible, or at least contact via phones or in the ways hybrid functions are, in other ways hybrid functions are available. And finally, we're also designing for entanglement. The development of a mutually constructed understanding of the justice-oriented ecology leads to different understandings of the technologies we develop. This means we must wholeheartedly take into account situated contextualization of technologies and accept that the reframing of research and justice can and will lead to the appropriation of these technologies based on particularities, histories, and reciprocal developments. It is the localized translations that help us develop synchronized co-evolutions for these different systems at play in the collaborations to develop a space where those who are invested are able to make compromises on not only the design, but also the use and appropriation of the digital technologies. So in short, working in justice-oriented ecologies means understanding the ecology itself and the context in which it sits, and working towards a future that is more just in that setting, with an understanding that meanings of justice may not agree with mainstream understandings, nor those of the criminal system. It means understanding the different layers of the meanings of justice, not just for those who provide services or those who are supposed to provide protection, but also from those who are victim survivors of this violence and pr protection, especially when it is violence and oppression perpetuated by those who are supposed to serve and protect them. But since developing this framework, I've been doing some more thinking. It's nice to have this language that I developed for me to better think about the work I do within the ecology that are third sector services and wider political spaces they work within and to work to learn about the ecology itself. But what does this actually mean in practice and how does it relate to the projects I've worked on and how does it this theoretical way of looking at feminist and justice oriented research translate into reality? 
If we know that diversity, coevolution, and systems are necessary for sustainable change in information ecologies, and if we add the notion of designing and third sector services as a praxis of hope to move towards more socially just worlds, we can see how working in this way can result in more than the development of innovative technologies. Really understanding the organization in which we work, which Nardi and O'Day refer to as being beginning habitation within the information ecology, where we develop a genuine understanding and a being part of the system, brings a new way of seeing the processes of designing these ecologies. Working in this way allows us researchers and designers to engage in an ongoing construction of the research space. It allows us to be a small part in this ongoing work towards more just worlds. And working in this way, and I've alluded to this previously, means we look at design and technologies as more than solutions. In a way, it forces us to look more closely at the design process itself. It forces us to confront the arrogance of our discipline, to think that technologies or design are going to solve complex socioeconomic concerns, wicked problems such as racism, or wicked cycles such as the links between poverty, environmental destruction, and the climate crisis. Instead, it forces us to see the humility in design as a non-solutionist approach to technologies, as a part of a wider ecology with its role to play but of equal or lower value than humans, connection, care, contextual awareness, and deep engagement with meanings of justice. Of course, this is also a kind of political consideration. It is a question of ontology and epistemology, a question of who participates in our research and in the development of novel technologies, and who doesn't. And very importantly, it also allows us to investigate why this is the case. This investigation into why and who participates in the development of technologies and the who and why they are impacted by this development in disproportionate ways is why having a political grounding is important when doing justice-oriented work. When we talk about justice, we cannot not talk about power structures, not least about formalized systems of justice or rather criminality. Of course, this then also relates to notions of Haraway situated knowledge and other notions of feminist standpoint theories. Situated knowledge insists on opening up contact zones with other ways of knowing the world, rather than relying on a singular power laden narrative. Haraway and others argue that one knowledge system should not dominate others, which in this case, I would interpret as the need for not giving sole truth power to structures such as criminal systems and to instead also understand justice from the perspective of those living in the world of abnormal justice. Not to produce a relativism, but rather to more fully understand and open other ways of knowing. So for design, this then means we should not only design ways of improving access to institutionalized systems of justice, or even mainstream approaches to social justice, but that we must tackle injustices at their roots, support folks who are already doing the work, and we must stay with that trouble to stick with Donna Har Haraway's ways of thinking, to develop alternative forms of understanding and building more just worlds. These kinds of issues relate directly to Fraser's conceptualization of abnormal and multidimensional justice, of course but also relate to research methods, to technologies we develop, to wider systems of inequity far beyond the reach of research and technology. Talking about sex work specifically, I want to start off with this quote from Juno Mack from a talk she gave in 2016. If you care about gender equality or poverty or migration or public health, then sex worker rights matter to you. This quote, for me, just highlights the importance of sex worker rights for all of us, but also the need for explorations of the intersections of justice. But how does their need, how does sex workers need for rights and safety relate to digital technologies? I'll present three different areas of research, issues of safety, supporting direct activism and remembrance on International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, and the process of making as community building to create a praxis of hope. I'm gonna talk about working with sex workers as an example here, 
But these kinds of political considerations and methodological considerations apply to many other communities who live in a world of abnormal justice as well. So what becomes clear from looking at sex worker rights is that worlds of abnormal justice are all around us and that they are impacted beyond the nation states that govern us. For example, the US introduced the widely contested Senate House bills called Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act and allow states and victims to fight online sex trafficking act, also known as SESTA FOSTA, which impacted sex workers far beyond the US. Within days, escorting sites in Canada, the UK, and elsewhere were shut down, and many sex workers were forced out of these online spaces to work in less safe conditions. This is just one example of how the American-dominated internet, um, as Barwiller calls it, impacts on sex worker safety, and arguably also the safety of others who are further marginalized by these and, by these and similar bills and policies. Sex workers are made vulnerable by stigma, legal status, and among other things, digital policies and laws. At the same time, however, they are resilient and skilled at countering such injustice through activism and the implementation of pragmatic solutions to problems. It's important for us to understand and learn from this work while also ensuring we as academics do not co-opt the work and research done by them. We must not see this from sex workers as a resource to be exploited. Instead, we must appreciate sex workers' expertise as what it is and work with them to better understand their experiences, share our relational expertise and use our power as academics to work towards enacting change. One way in which I've tried to do this is by working with sex workers, sex work support organizations who provide life-saving services such as bad clients and aggressor lists, or which are sometimes also known as ugly mugs reports. And these are instances where sex workers exchange information on potentially dangerous clients, both online and offline. I worked with organizations in the UK and in Canada to study the digitalization of these community-driven safety practices. And I do not wish to compare these two organizations that you can see on the screen at the moment, nor the work that they do. They operate in different countries with different legal contexts, histories of oppression and activism, and have different foci for their services. I am bringing these two together here to share learning from both of them to then develop new questions for us to think about. On the slide, I've written the implications for a design from both of these studies. I do not have time to go into detail here, but do just want to point toward the need for contextualizing experiences of safety and the importance of multi-layered impacts of services on safety, solidarity, and advocacy. In the paper where collaborators and I address the bad client and aggressor list, we describe multiple uses and purposes of this particular partially digitally mediated technology as a way of imagining processes that are more just for sex workers experiencing violence. We argue that the list, as it's also sometimes known as, has been successful in achieving its many purposes exactly because it does not strive to solve the problem of violence, but rather because it is recognized as an intervention that can support the ongoing battle for sex workers' rights. It is pragmatically, aesthetically, and emotionally situated within the organization's aims, embracing the humanity and peer elements necessary for the list to do its work. The second project that I want to talk about is my participation and invitation to participate in an activist action on International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers in Newcastle, where, where I'm still based. So, in, in this project, I supported the direct activism and remembrance of the lives lost in the last year due to violence on this internationally recognized Sex Worker Rights Day. So the day consists of an activist march through Newcastle using red umbrellas, an international system for sex workers' rights. It's then followed by an incredibly emotional remembrance service um, with poetry readings, song performances, and a number of activities to, to, to remember and celebrate the lives that had been lost. This event is then followed by a reception, which in 
2017 and 2000, no, 16 and 17 included the crafting of the Red Umbrella Archive, where people who participated in the day's activities were able to share their experiences. Wooden umbrellas could be decorated with red craft supplies as glitter and feathers, which could then be placed onto a small computer as is seen in the top right image on the screen, which was built as part of Alexander Wilson's Jigsaw project, if you're interested. On this computer screen then, an audio message, a story, poem, or experience could be audio recorded. And this recording is then linked to the wooden artifact through RFID tags. So the archive is made up of the wooden pieces and a website where the recordings can be listened to. And in, in the second time around we did this, we presented the umbrellas from the year before and offered an opportunity to listen to those stories while working on new, new wooden umbrellas that year. And the third project I want to talk about is the process of making, literally sewing, as community building to create a praxis of hope. And I've talked a lot about this project called the Partnership Quilt, so I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but in this project, it was really not about the artifact that came out at the end, which was a, a quilted blanket with embedded capacitive touch sensors that when you touched certain parts of the blankets, you could, with headphones, listen to the stories of the women who were involved in this project. So it was about the process of sewing together rather than that finished product. It was about the sharing of stories and experiences, making each other cups of tea. It was about developing that shared praxis of hope, of co-developing a shared understanding and practice, which has turned into a sustainable relationship that is genuinely co-constructed, where organizational practice of the third sector organization that collaborated with me on this project influences my research and vice versa. And there is a genuine recognition and celebration of the different knowledges and understandings we each bring to this collaboration. So what may not be visible from this very quick look at these very different projects is that an ethos of justice runs through them from start to finish, from the aims through the methodology and methods, all the way to the impacts and ways of understanding the projects. As you may have seen, I added information about publications associated with each of these projects, which give a much more detailed look at them. And importantly, each of these projects also have associated visual reports, which show you more about the process and which are accessible to non-academic audiences. Hopefully this work illustrates my belief that as researchers and academics, we must not only talk, talk about and theorize on justice, especially in design and technology spaces, we have the ability to enact genuine change and to support individuals and make changes to inequities and oppressions. But quite importantly, we can also contribute to these same inequities and oppressions, or even create new ones. And this building of new is arguably part of our ethos of innovation, of building systems and algorithms, and doing it quickly for our annual publication cycles. This, of course, can then in turn be rife with the potential of unintended consequences of algorithms and systems that discriminate. Taking this into consideration, I do think we have a tendency to over rely on discussions of unintended consequences in technology development on how designers and algorithm of algorithms and data infrastructures just aren't considering diversity or potential consequences of their work enough. And we have to continue to call out these kinds of injustice and injustices and unintended consequences when we see them. But it's also important, and that's why this orientation of justice was so important to me at the beginning of this presentation. It's important for us to also realize and acknowledge that not all injustices and inequities are accidental or unintended. Fraser's concept of abnormal justice allows us to understand that justice is not universal, linear, or entirely equitable. It has different meanings for different communities and groups. Using justice-oriented ecologies in turn then allows us to, one, design better systems and technologies that are context aware, value driven and fit into existing ecologies of care that try to avoid these unintended consequences. 
but it also, quite importantly, allows us to unpick what are intended and unintended consequences of technologies and their infrastructures. It gives us the language and weapons to call out when systems are working in precisely the way they are supposed to, pointing towards systemic and epistemic violence and injustices, rather than pointing towards individual instances of oppression or marginalization. In an attempt to draw my talk to a close, I want to offer some final questions that drive my thinking, or rather that make me think and complicate my fieldwork to the point of where I give as theoretical a talk as I have done today. Um, as I've stated before, third sector organizations and the people they support exist in a state of constant precarity, and to a degree also in cycles of crises. Increasingly so, so do university staff and universities and our research practices within them. And we cannot ignore that we are now over one year deep into a global pandemic that has altered our existence. A lot of my talk has related to hopeful design, design processes, and how our work as technologists and researchers can be part of the development of alternative or more just worlds. But what does it mean to be world making in a time of crisis? While we're currently in what feels like a perpetual crisis due to COVID-19, the climate emergency, rising unemployment and poverty, third sector services operate in a context where their services and those they support are constantly in immediate crises related to individuals or support um, or personal circumstances of service users, but also organizational needs, wider political changes and the constant need to compete for necessary funding. They are facing funding cuts left, right, and center, and are finding creative ways of overcoming these institutional challenges. On top of all of this, they operate, um, oops, um, they, they operate with a very strange underlying ethos. They are working towards a world where they should no longer exist. They are working towards worlds where their services are no longer needed, towards more just worlds. So three questions that I come to again and again in my research are what do the worlds that we are making together and working towards look like? How do we actually work towards these worlds or enact our values in current practice? And what role can I as a researcher play in working alongside my friends, colleagues and partners to enact this praxis of hope and care through pragmatic solidarity? The answers to these questions will likely be ever changing and malleable based on experiences, unlearning, changes in official structures, but also very simply based on whom I speak to in an organization. But this is perhaps why the ideas around justice oriented design, ecologies and praxis of hope are so interesting to me when working with third sector organizations that support people who are made marginal, who are stigmatized, and those who are criminalized for merely existing and surviving. So thank you again for listening, and I'd really love to answer any questions that you have and hear about how the framework of justice-oriented ecologies or, or any of the considerations I talked about could relate to your own work or thinking. My email address is also again on the slide and please don't hesitate to get in touch at any point um, if you'd like to talk or think through anything I've said today that might impact on how you're thinking or working. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all of these thoughts. I have like a million sort of bullet points and things like that that I'd love to, I'd love to ask about, but uh, there's actually already some questions. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and dive into them. Um, uh, Emmeline asks, uh, how would you situate your work in the broader history of participatory art oriented towards social, uh, i.e. feminist justice? Thank you, Emmeline. <laughs> that's, that's an easy question to start with. Oof. Um, how would I situate my work? I think it, I draw a lot on um, kind of feminist STS notions of, of care in that really thick sense of where care also includes aspects of um, critique and critique as a kind of 
I, I think as Kata Spiel calls it, as an act of love, um, where that is all part of that care and responsibility where it, it's not just this nice fluffy, oh, you're so nice, let's have hugs situation of care, but where it is also about what does this actually mean and how can we work together to, to work through this issue that we have or to work through the situation that we're in. So that's kind of one side of it. Um, and the participatory arts practice. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about the Partnership Quilt Project, which is the second one I, I, I talked about today. And there I draw on the histories of, of mostly women's work in documenting and telling stories through textiles. And there is a really wonderful um, history to that. And across the world, textiles and the making of them and the, the the keeping of them and the the heirloom element of the textile that I'm really, really inspired by and, and have been thinking about a lot more with those metaphors of sewing and, and patchwork and mending and slowing down a little bit. And that that arts or textiles and craft practice have really helped me understand the craft of making technologies as well. And how actually there's a lot to learn from these textiles practices in technologies, which of course the histories are super intertwined. Um, the first technology was a, was a loom, um, a, a fabric weaving loom. So that, that history um, and reading more and more and learning more about that history is, is also super inspiring. And I don't know if that answered your question, Emmeline, um, but yeah, I'm gonna leave it there, I think, <laughs> unless you have a follow-up. Uh, I think that's great. Um, Blaine asks, uh, in your research, to what extent do you distinguish between mutual aid versus the third sector? Uh, and they ask in parentheses, is the third sector nonprofit sector? Yeah, I know that there's a lot of um, politic around charities and NGOs and mutual aid. And um, to what extent do I distinguish between the two? I think most of the organizations I've worked with would not class themselves as mutual aid organizations. And um, that's not out of, a, out of anything, it's just they are established charities with legal, like a charity is a, is a, is a thing that's enshrined in law and you need certain structures and um, things in place to be able to call yourself a charity. Um, I personally, actually think mutual aid is part of the third sector. Um, and that's where maybe that distinction between kind of UK and US language comes in as well, um, where nonprofit is also kind of part of the third sector. Um, but so I think is mutual aid. And to me, mutual aid is a wonderful, wonderful thing um, that we should always support if, if possible. Um, but they are, yeah, they are very different organizationally and structurally and kind of who they have to or don't have to answer to. Um, and there, there's a lot of politic involved in working with the third sector and charities or nonprofit organizations. Um, you know, that there's funding structures and where does that funding come from? There's, there's boards of governance to answer to. And there's, um, at least in the UK, also kind of different structures in place that need to be followed if you are a legally recognized charity. Um, which a mutual aid organization doesn't necessarily have in the same enshrined in law kind of way, if that makes sense. I d again, I don't know if I answered that question, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I appreciated it. Um, I, I thought that was illuminating. Um, I, uh, I realize there's only a little bit of time left, but I guess I'm, I'm sort of curious about your thoughts uh, at like a very high level. Um, do you feel like I mean, you and I are sort of both in the HCI space, maybe like to varying degrees of overlap. Uh, do you feel like the HCI world has changed or grown or matured on on this subject of of thinking about the ecology and working within and then also sort of making sense of the ecology within which we exist uh, or the various ecologies within which researchers exist? Like, could you speak I, to some extent about like the changes that you've seen or either over your career or historically? I think so. I, I think as a field, we're not very old, um, but we've definitely had a, an interesting history, um, kind of starting with computer scientists and so psychologists kind of going, how can we work together to make 
you know, usability was a thing that's not very long ago, but it seems like epistemologically a long time ago. Um, and I definitely think we're moving super quickly. And this, this understanding of justice, I think it was in 2016 that the justice oriented interaction design paper came out. And that was right as I was doing my PhD. And I remember reading it and rereading it and rereading it and just continuously like going through it. And I had the same copy in my hands with different highlighters and notes every time I read it. Um, and there used to be maybe a handful of papers at conferences that address this issue, whereas now we have a handful of sessions that address these issues. Um, so there definitely is a, an increase of thinking about this. And I do think that's a good thing because it, again, it provides these different kinds of knowledges and different perspectives. Um, but I, I do wish there were more diversity in perspectives um, not just from the researchers, but also the communities we work with in a deeply engaged way. Um, I do think there definitely is still a tendency of that going into a community, doing some research, building a system, you know, leaving, but that is getting questioned more and more and more. And taking Kai as an example, as the biggest conference in the discipline, um, you know, the establishment of that new subcommittee is absolutely wonderful. And I mean, I was an AC on it. So like I had a very positive experience. <laughs> um, it was really wonderful. And all of these things that we've talked about in panels or in you know hidden back channels between researchers of, oh, I wish the review process were more careful. And I wish reviewers understood more about the work I'm doing because a lot of this kind of research a few years ago, you'd get reviewers that didn't, get it and they were like just didn't get it clearly and sometimes that was a good thing and sometimes that was a bad thing um whereas i feel now there's there's a lot of researchers who have done the same learning i have done or very similar kinds of learning and they're in similar career positions as me now where we have phd students that we supervise there are research assistants that we work with and you know it, it is that growing web of understanding and of, of unlearning and, and thinking about these really naughty issues. Um, so yes, going in the right direction, I think, um, but definitely a lot of work to be done and different sub audiences and communities of the sector are definitely at different stages in this process. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that the discipline as a whole has really dealt with these issues. Um, but there's definite pockets that have really deeply engaged with it or are deeply engaging with it at the moment. That's, uh, that's great. I think that on that, both sort of upbeat, but also, I guess, like hopeful for future work kind of note, mm -hmm. um, I'll go ahead and thank everybody for coming and attending this uh, webinar. Um, I really appreciate it again, Dr. Strohmeyer. Thank you so much for coming and talking about this work. Uh, and thank all of you attendees uh, who are here for, uh, for coming and attending. And if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let you all get going now. Um, have a great weekend.